This is a 2022 Vitpillin, and I've always wanted one and picked one up last week. With it came a giant bag of spare parts and the worst 3D printed thing I've ever seen. This is supposed to be a secondary air intake, but I think it's a secondary rock intake. Um, I'm gonna go design it right today. All right, so this is the 3D printed air box lid that came with our motorcycle. Um, compared to the OEM one, it's got a supplemental intake, which apparently on dynos adds like two or three horsepower. Um, so that's awesome. But the part itself, leaves a bit to be asking for. Like it's, you know, like it's literally delaminating in my hands. Uh, it also seems over extruded in the center, but besides the point, it's, it's, a good it's a decent design. It's even like a single part print in place, which I really like. Um, compared to the OEM intake, it's missing like two critical features. So the OEM intake has this O-ring groove, which seals against the air box. You absolutely need that or you're gonna get air leakage if anything creeps or moves. And then it's also got these steel inserts to take up the bolt torque. Um, on our design, we're gonna make sure we include the O-ring groove. We'll probably skip the steel inserts because this guy's only torqued to two and a half Newton meters, which our carbon reinforced nylons are gonna be fine handling at these temperatures. Um, lastly, I think we're gonna make a two-part foam holder. Um, this is slick that it's one piece, but I just want better clamping to keep the foam in place. And with a two part design, we can really have like a nice ceiling strip around the edge that'll compress it more. All right, so at this point, we've got to capture this geometry into CAD. And there's quite a few ways to do it. And I think where everyone jumps to is 3D scanning, but I honestly don't think that's necessary. I, 3D scanning takes an hour or two every time. And for simple parts that are essentially two dimensional, there's a way easier way with all you really need is a cell phone camera and a pair of calipers or a ruler. So we've got this little setup over here. Um, the lights mostly, so it looks good on film, but you do want a white piece of paper for contrast. Um, so just take your calipers or ruler, make sure it's roughly the size of the part. The exact number doesn't really matter. Set it down here, put your part beside it, get them nice and close, and then just pull out your cell phone and open up the camera app. You wanna to go to the longest lens you have, and you just wanna hold your camera module as directly above the part as you can. Zoom in so you're nice and tight, focus on the part, and snap a few pictures. So we've got this photo now, and we've got the tip-to-tip -tip measurement on the calipers, as well as an almost parallax-free image of the part. So I can bring this into Fusion, or whatever CAD I'm using, uh, insert this as a canvas, and just trace all my geometry off this photo. Okay, so the first step in building out this new airbox lid is importing the photo that I just took. Once you bring it in, the canvas tools here let you calibrate the size of the image. With the calibers that we had, we're just gonna click on the points and we're just gonna type in the number that shows up there. Um, that should get the canvas to the right size. So the photo should now be essentially the real size in CAD. Next thing I always like doing is putting in this calibration reference. So this is a sketch that's centered on the origin of this project. And all I do is I just draw a vertical and a horizontal line. Once I have that, I can edit my canvas and just use the tools in here to rotate it so it's lined up, as well as move it around positionally. My goal is always to align it both in direction and position. So my origin is at a sensible place of the part. On this one, in the injection molding, there's already this like crosshair. So I'm just lining up with that because it makes it easy for me to get both vertical horizontal alignment and positioning. Once you got those two parts done, the next step is really capturing this outline, which is honestly, it's kind of tricky. And this is probably the hardest thing you have to do when you're reverse engineering a part. Um, there's a couple tricks in here that do make things a bit easier. So first of all, Assume that the person that made this part, if they did it in CAD, so anything in the last 10 years, assume that the designer t used whole numbers when they could. So this air box was designed by KTM. So it was made somewhere in India or somewhere in Austria. 
which means it's metric. So as I'm laying out the holes to this image, you know, I just rounded to sensible whole millimeter numbers and I could. Like this looked like it was about 56. So I'm just assuming the designer actually did that. And then for tracing the outline, so the outline of the part and then the ceiling channel, I always try to limit myself in what features I'm going to use. For this part, there's only two, three features used. There is a circle, there is a line, and then there's an arc. And between these three sketch tools, that is this entire thing. And I think it's easy to overcomplicate things and start using things like splines or more complex shapes to be more perfect. But it's an injection molded part, which means it's probably not perfect. And simplifying it to just using very basic features helps you just get through it. And lastly, like there's a couple things here that are green. These are fixed parts that aren't really dimensioned. They're just arbitrary and I set them to be fixed. Generally a bad practice, but when you're tracing a canvas, that's often the best you can do. Once you have the basic design done, so all of your critical geometry, the first thing I always do is I make a test pattern. This is just the outline of the part extruded to be like a millimeter or two thick. And this let me validate whether my sketch based on the canvas was accurate or not. Once you have that done, it's really about figuring out the rest of the design of the part and what you find important. So this part ends up being three pieces. So we've got our top tray. So this is what bolts the air box. We've got our foam holder, which screws to the bottom. And then we have this TPU gasket. There's a couple of things when you're designing a part that I think are always important to think about. First of all is a bit of failure analysis. You know, what happens if this breaks? How would it break? And how do you minimize systematic failure? So on this, this foam holder screws into the top plate. And I made sure I put the screws on the outside, not the inside, so if the screws wiggle loose, they're captured by this top plate. They're not gonna just fall straight down into your intake. <laughs> Uh, you know, I think an M3 screw will completely destroy an engine within, you know, 10 seconds. The other thing to be mindful of is how hard the part is to assemble. So you can see that our cutout here for our foam holder, we could technically fit more foam around, you know, if we maximize our volume here. But we designed it around a foam element that is a rectangle with a truncated corner. This just makes it easy to cut. I want to make these parts easy for me to make and for other people to make. And then the last thing is really about the printability of the part. So with 3D printing, you have to be mindful of tolerances and overhangs. So as I was designing this, I kept in mind which direction each part was going to be printing from. But for this top plate, I knew that I was going to print on this bottom surface the whole time because I needed a lot more geometry up top. If I had to print it on this face, we'd end up with a whole bunch of supports and stuff. But I made sure I had a large flat face. With that, I put small chamfers on all of the bottom features just to make sure that elephant's footing or a little bit of spreading on the bed wouldn't interfere with fitment. On the inside, I have a lot more steps and ridges to capture this as well as the O-ring. And that's fine because, you know, I don't need supports for any of that. Same thing on the foam holder. This guy was intended to print on this bottom surface from the start. So all of my geometry, any more complex features like this little ridge here that holds a bit more pressure on the foam, this is all on the top side, once again, to avoid needing support on anything. And the result of that is like this whole thing prints pretty easily. Obviously we've got, we have this TPU ring here. It's, there's no DFM, it's literally a profile <laughs> extruded. But once we import this into our slicer, the auto orientate feature actually just works really well with stuff like this. When we slice this, you can see that like there's no supports needed. It's a super easy part to print. And this whole thing is done in about four hours. If you split it across two beds, it's two hours apart. Okay, so we got all the parts we need now. Um, so this is the airbox top. This is our filter housing. Uh, this just slots and in, slots into here. 
and there's a little millimeter uh, lip there, so it positions itself. We've got our gasket, which is printed out of our TPU. Uh, we got a bag of self-tapping M3 screws, and we've got a guide for cutting our foam. We got our uni foam over here. I think that's our first step. We'll see if this knife is sharp. Okay, right, that's doing fine. That looks pretty good. With uni filters, or most of these foam filters, they need oil to function. If you don't oil them, they do not filter very much. So we're just using uni brand foam filter oil. It's kind of the standard. It's simultaneously sticky and slippery. It feels awful. Yeah. I like just kind of getting it in there while it's still got all that solvent in. Yeah. So let's put this in here. So I went pretty tight on the thread clearances. So I'm going by feel. I did not expect that. After our little incident earlier with breaking off a screw in the part, um, we printed a new one. So the new one has an extra 50 micron of hole diameter. So hopefully less binding. Um, so I'm glad on how all the threads retain that we'll snap a screw before we pull the threads out. So we're gonna just reset and we will attempt this whole assembly process again. It's crazy how big of a difference 50 microns makes. It's always funny when our plastic parts are stronger than metal hardware. So I'm just gonna like soft seat and then maybe like an eighth of a turn after that. <laughs> so this fits, it's directional, so it fits over this way. Okay. So we don't really need anything else to retain it because that's a good enough fit. Um, I think we just throw this on the bike now. Our new housing just fits on top. Oh, that's a, that's a nice snug fit. That's satisfying. I don't know why, but I'm paranoid and I want to check if I dropped anything in the air box. We're probably fine, aren't we? It's fine. Yeah, let's send it. Oh. Oh yeah. All right. Okay, that is definitely an extra intake. I really wish we could take this outside and see if it feels like any difference, but that's what outside is right now. Yeah. Welcome to Vancouver, I guess. Yeah. When I first designed this last night, um, Stanley, our head of mech, had a giant list of problems. So we just wanted to do a bit of a retrospective on like this part, Stanley's issues with it, as well as like what I think could be done better and like what we're happy with. So like, what was, what did you say? You said, this is not the highest performance I could do. Yeah, so in summary, is this a better air filter? I think so, but it's not the best air filter. And I feel like if we're trying to make something the Pantheon way, we should try and aim for greatness, not yeah. just good. Well, and I, I think that's where we got into this interesting conversation about what the best meant. Like for you, it meant performance. Yeah, maximum airflow. For me, it was a combination of performance, printability, and you know, being able to put this part out open source and have anyone be able to execute on it. And that's where we, I think, really found our differences where I was like, I do not, you know, if you have to cut this piece of foam, it's only straight lines. I don't want people to have to cut a curve. When I look at these two side by side, I was like, uh, you know, it feels like 
the surface area isn't that much more. You said it was 50%? 30 to 50%. Which is okay, but yeah. I figured, hey, why not just make the entire outline the filter, maximize that surface area. Yeah. I also talked about having spikes to retain the filter. Yeah. So you didn't have to have huge grates that could cover the, the intake area. Yeah, so like have like either print in place or like, you print know, place probably spikes, yeah. maybe even just like M2 screws. Or just screws, yeah. Um, and those would actually like hold the filter element in tension so it could just be open in the middle. Yeah. And I think you brought up that uh, it'd be really slick if we didn't need extra fasteners. Yeah, I was asking why don't we just latch everything together? You talked about how you want this to be accessible. If you don't have to buy any extra screws, then... That's a good point too. I, I think in my head, if you could order it on Amazon, it counted as accessible. So I was really careful, like this only uses like all the hardware, the Uni Very foam. generic hardware. It's all on Amazon. A lot of people have been doing these Airbox mods and like, can you agree that most of them are like atrocious? Yes. Yeah. Like I said, this is good. But I feel like we could have gone that extra mile for the best. The best. I wanted to make this like um, accessible. So like I, I'm sure if we did clips and someone printed on an HS3, it'd be perfect. Yeah. But I wanted to make sure that like a consumer printer could do this. Yeah. Because like how many people have one of our machines in you know their garage? It's all businesses. But maybe we can go further if people want, and we will make the Stanley version that is engineering perfection and a product manager's nightmare. So the things that I'm happy and unhappy with, it's a little bit tight, like it fits perfectly in this air box, but I think I have to open up this clearance a bit for manufacturing tolerances and that injection molding part. I'm not confident this would fit everyone's air box. Before we release these parts, I'm gonna fix the OD tolerance, just be a bit more forgiving, because we yeah. don't need tight, we don't need high tolerance there. And I'm gonna add some debosses to the top that show you what the, just to spec the OD torque. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, I think you guys did a great job. Yeah. It's definitely much better than what we had before. You know, you're only gonna have this happen. Yeah. The foam's retained really well. And it looks nice. Yeah. It looks nice. Um, the, the extra pressure band around the edge um, squishes the foam by 50% and it actually like yep. it holds really well. Oh, last thing, um, just like as a PSA out there, a lot of people put these foam filters on their bikes. You have to oil them. Yes, guys, don't forget a to oil them. A foam filter does not work without oil. So this actually came dry. Yes. And it didn't come with oil, so. But it's not a, sh you can, it's like you must oil your filter or it's not a filter, it's just a piece of foam. We're gonna release this on Thingiverse and a few other platforms. Download it, print it. Please don't blame us if it blows up your bike. <laughs> and good luck.